Excerpt from the presentation given by Metropolitan Herothios Vlakos before the Synod of the Church of Greece on the 6th of October 2011 on the recognition of the council convoked in Constantinople in the year of our Lord 879-880 as the 8th ecumenical. Section 3. The Council of the Year 879-880 The council that convened in Constantinople in the year 879-880, over which St. Photius the Great presided, and in which 383 fathers participated from east and west, representing the five ancient patriarchates, including the one of Old Rome, restored the peace and unity of the Church after various unpleasant events. This presentation does not purpose to refer to those events, as I have already done so in other texts of mine. The fact is that this council has all the elements that would justify its characterization as ecumenical. Wherefore, thus has it been called by many fathers and teachers, such as Theodore Balsamon, Nihilus of Thessalonica, Nicholas Cabasilas, Nihilus of Rhodes, Macarius of Ancyra, St. Simeon of Thessalonica, St. Mark Evgenicus of Ephesus, Joseph Bryennius, Gennadius Scalarius, Dositheus of Jerusalem, Constantine Oikonomos, et alia, but also by more recent ones, such as Chrysostom Papadopoulos, Archbishop of Athens, who wrote that this council has not only the external but also all the internal features of an ecumenical council and dealt with serious dogmatic issues, such as the addition of the Filioque and the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. This council is ecumenical and is so called because it was convoked by Emperor Basil the Macedonian. Representatives of all the patriarchates attended it, St. Photius the Great and the representatives of the Pope of Rome presided. It dealt with serious dogmatic and ecclesiological issues, and its decisions align with the teachings of the prophets, apostles, and fathers of the Church. In other words, they are in harmony with the whole tradition of the Church. The minutes of this council were published by Dositheus, Patriarch of Jerusalem, in his book Tome of Joy, which was printed in Rimnik of Wallachia in September of the year 1705, a year and a half before Dositheus' death. For this edition of the Minutes of the Eighth Ecumenical Council, he used the 16th century manuscript of the Monastery of Ivoron. A careful reading of the minutes of this council leads the reader to realize that the council proclaims itself ecumenical and is thus titled by the emperors, St. Photius the Great, the Pope's legates, and its members. The term ecumenical occurs dozens of times in the minutes. All the members of the council believe that they are the continuation of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which they hence ratify as ecumenical. So the Seventh Ecumenical Council was ratified by this council that we are now examining, and this, among other things, is a testament to its seriousness. A significant dissertation on the topic of this important council has been written by the priest Philip Zimares, entitled The Historical, Dogmatic, and Canonical Significance of the Council of Constantinople, 879-880, which has not been published. I propose that the Apostolic Ministry of the Church of Greece publish it for its importance. This dissertation was submitted in the Pastoral Department of the Theological School of the University of Thessalonica and was approved by it while Professor and Metropolitan of Pergamus John Zazoulis was rapporteur. Upon carefully reading this dissertation, one realizes the great significance of the council which has been justly called Eighth Ecumenical. The author commences with the realization that unfortunately in the West, this important council has been considered either as a false council or as not having done work of any significance, that is, that it did not proceed to make any dogmatic decision. If one should read its minutes, however, he would be convinced that in these fathers there was a clear ecclesiological conscience. The goal of the dissertation in question is to ascertain the ecclesiological importance of the Council of 879-880, which was important for the Church and ultimately for the world today. Finally, 
it is proven that this council could be considered an exposition of ecclesiology, since all the topics that were discussed have a common ecclesiological framework, and the decisions regarding these matters clearly indicate this specific ecclesiological consciousness, which is a continuation of the consciousness of the foregoing fathers of the Church. The main topics of discussion at the Council were five, namely, first, the primacy of the Pope, second, the offices in the Church and their interrelationship, third, the local customs, fourth, the immediate raising of a layman to the rank of bishop, consecutive ordination, and fifth, the filioque. Also significant is the analysis of the councils of the year 869-870, which condemned St. Photius, and of the year 879-880, which we are studying, done by the bishop of Abidos, Cyril Caterellos, in his study entitled, Rome and Papal Primacy During the Patriarchate of Ignatius and St. Photius, 847-886, the Eighth Ecumenical Council of the Roman Catholic Church, 869-870. At this point, we shall need to briefly look at two of these topics so as to show the significance of this ecumenical council. The Primacy of the Pope the first issue was the primacy of the Pope. The discussion that took place in the council between St. Photius the Great, the Eastern bishops, but also the representatives of the Pope clearly showed that the Pope does have primacy in the Church, but with clear ecclesiological boundaries, as these are defined by the 34th Apostolic Canon. That is, he is first only with respect to seniority, within and not above the Church. According to this view, each hierarch that does not keep the spirit of the apostolic canon places himself outside of the church and is defrocked or excommunicated. The popes are no exception. The legates of the pope at the council were maintaining that only St. Peter and the popes his successors have the authority to bind and to loose, that is, priesthood. Therefore the pope, as the successor of the chief of the apostles, is the only source of the priesthood, and consequently, any authority that Photius happens to have does not proceed from his own archpriesthood, bishophood, but from the Pope. St. Photius the Great and the fathers of this council supported primacy of honor as a necessary ecclesiological principle for the preservation of the unity of the Church throughout the world. According to primacy of honor, However, the preservation of this unity is clearly not perceived as imposed by one primus, who is above the Church as an authority. This position is clearly expressed in an epistle of Photius, in which he emphasizes the orthodox interpretation of the Gospel passage Matthew 16, 18-19. This interpretation leads to the crucial ecclesiological principle that each bishop is of equal honor with respect to his archpriesthood, bishophood. The Pope has the privilege of honor and must abide by the canons of the Church, while this privilege must be exercised within the spirit of the holy canons. This means that the Pope has no jurisdiction in other ecclesiastical dioceses. When the Pope does not keep the canons and places himself above the Church, then he can be defrocked, as was done with Pope Nicholas I, who was defrocked because he interfered with Constantinople and Bulgaria. So it appears that the primacy of the Pope, according to the Westerners, is founded not on a canonical and ecclesiological, but on a dogmatic basis, namely, that the priesthood of the Pope is the fount of the priesthood of all the other patriarchs and bishops. This is precisely where the issue lies, not in the primacy of honor or the presidency of the council. This could never, nor can it now ever, be accepted by the Orthodox Church. As one reads the minutes and the discussions that took place during the commencement of the council, he realizes that in the beginning there appear two kinds of ecclesiology, the Western, which viewed the Pope as the head of the whole Church, and the Eastern, which consists of the conciliar system of governance, on the basis of the holy canons and the tradition of the Church. The legates, it seems, tried to impose the Western kind of ecclesiology, 
but with the wisdom and the shrewd interventions of Patriarch Photius and of the other members, the Eastern ecclesiology fully prevailed, which is founded on the conciliar system of church governance and on the non-interference of ecclesiastical dioceses in another ecclesiastical diocese. Very telling in this regard is the first canon that this council drafted in its fifth act, which institutes the autonomy of each ecclesiastical diocese in matters of order and discipline. According to this canon, if any bishop, clergy, or layman belonging to the Pope is punished by him, he is to be subjected to the same punishment also by the Patriarch of Constantinople, and vice versa. The canon concludes, None of the privileges belonging to the most holy throne of the Church of the Romans, or to her primate, being at all changed or innovated, neither now nor hereafter. This means the acceptance of the conciliar system of governance, and the primacy of the Pope is not a primacy of authority, but a primacy of honor. In other words, the Pope is not the head of the whole Church. He is not the fount of priesthood and therefore he has no jurisdiction in other ecclesiastical dioceses. According to Zonaros, the fathers of the council did not wish the Pope of Elder Rome and the patriarch of this new one, Constantinople, to be at variance with each other, but rather to be of one mind, for they were still of one faith and of one throne. This canon is of crucial ecclesiological importance, since it restores a Eucharistic view of the ecclesiastical structure throughout the world. The ecclesiastical importance of this canon lies not only in that it stresses the equality of honor of the Church of Constantinople with Old Rome, but also because it by extension also implies the equality of honor of all local churches throughout the world. This canon was a corrective step against the pyramid Western global ecclesiology, which was expressed in the previous Council of 869-870, and according to which the only truly local church in the foregoing sense of Catholicity is the Church of Rome, which is identified with a global church, and the only essential bishop is the Pope of Rome. The Filioque the second point that concerned this important council that we are studying is the question of the filioque, the addition introduced by the Franks into the symbol of faith that the Holy Spirit proceeds as an hypostasis from the Father and the Son. The Frankish missionaries had introduced the filioque into Bulgaria, and that was why this topic was posed to the council. It is the essentialist view of the Holy Trinity, which has Neoplatonic roots. As a result, essentialism destroys the correct theology of the Holy Trinity, since it destroys the fount of divinity, which is the monarchy of the Father. This serious question was discussed during the sixth session, and it was decided to forbid this cacodoxy. At the suggestion of Emperor Basil, who was attending, the council decided to condemn the filioque, that is, the introduction into the symbol of faith by the Franks, of the heretical teaching on the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and from the Son, which the Franks had introduced also in Bulgaria. The deacon and proto-notary Peter, at the command of St. Photius the Great, read the relevant decree which prescribed the keeping of the symbol of faith of Nicaea and the complete defrocking of the clergymen that add or subtract spurious words into the symbol of faith, and also the anathematization of laymen that do this. More specifically, after the introductory lines, the decree of this ecumenical council states, We expel those whom they remove from the church, but we embrace and regard worthy of reception those whom they declared as deserving honor and sacred respect as being men of the same faith or even teachers of piety. Thus believing and thus declaring regarding these things, we embrace with mind and tongue and declare to all people with a loud voice the definition of the most pure faith of the Christians, which has come down even to us from the beginning through the fathers, subtracting nothing, adding nothing, changing nothing, falsifying nothing. For subtraction and addition, 
when no heresy is stirred up by the ingenuous fabrications of the evil one, introduces condemnation of the uncondemnable and an inexcusable assault on the fathers. But to change with falsified words the definitions of the fathers is much worse than the foregoing. Therefore, this holy and ecumenical council, embracing with divine longing and uprightness of mind the definition of the faith that was from the beginning and considering it divine, therein also founding and erecting the firmament of salvation, is of this mind and cries out to all to proclaim. Thereupon the symbol of faith was read, without the addition of the phrase, proceedeth and from the Son, and straightway the decree declares, Thus we believe, into this confession of the faith we were baptized, through it the word of truth has shown every heresy to be shattered and destroyed. Those who are of this mind we call brothers and fathers and fellow heirs of the heavenly commonwealth. But should someone dare to compose another exposition besides this sacred symbol, which has come down even to us from our blessed and sacred fathers, and call it a definition of faith, and thus steal for himself the dignity of the confession of those divine men, and enfold it with his own inventions, and set it forth as a common lesson to the faithful, or even to those returning from some heresy, and be so audacious as to utterly adulterate with spurious words or additions or subtractions, the antiquity of this sacred and venerable definition, in accordance with a decree that has been declared already before us by the holy and ecumenical councils. If he be one of the clergymen, we subject him to complete defrocking, and if he be a layman, we defer him to the anathema. The mention of layman refers to Charlemagne, who introduced the filioque into the clergymen and bishops of Charlemagne's jurisdictions, who introduced the symbol of faith with the filioque into the divine services and disseminated it thus into Bulgaria as well. After the reading of this decree, the entire present sacred concourse cried out, Thus are we all minded, thus do we believe. Into this confession we were baptized and vouchsafe the priestly rank. Them who are otherwise minded, in violation of these things, we regard as enemies of God and of the truth. Should someone dare to compose and set up another symbol besides this one, or to add or subtract, and be so bold as to declare it a definition, he is condemned and cast away from all Christian confession. For to subtract or to add is to portray as imperfect the confession to the holy and consubstantial and undivided trinity which has been from the beginning to this very day. It convicts the apostolic tradition and the doctrine of the fathers. Should therefore someone arrive at such an end of mindlessness as to dare, as has been said above, to set up another symbol and call it a definition, or to make either an addition or a subtraction in the one handed down to us from the holy and ecumenical first great council in Nicaea, let him be anathema. In his notes on the minutes of the Eighth Ecumenical Council, Dositheus of Jerusalem writes that at this council it became clear that even in the Roman Church no addition had yet crept into the symbol of faith, but was rather invented later. If the priests of Pope Nicholas were teaching in Bulgaria the procession of the Holy Spirit also from the Son, yet they were doing so of their own mind and not by the order of the Pope. This is evident from the fact that even at the council that Pope Hadrian had convened by his petition to the emperor against Photius, that is, at the council of 869-870, it was decreed that the symbol remain without any innovation, and their representatives had not disagreed, just as the representatives of Pope John did not disagree in this council. Of course, here it must be noted that it was Charlemagne that introduced the addition into the symbol of faith at the Council of Aachen in 809 and imposed it upon the bishops of his realm, but was then met with the reaction of the Pope of Rome. Later, however, in 1009, when Sergius IV, who was a Francophile, became Pope of Rome, he introduced the filioque into the symbol of faith, whereupon he was struck from the diptychs, and so we get the final schism, that is, 
the separation of the Church of Rome, of the Franco-Latins, from the Orthodox Church. From the foregoing, it is evident that there is no doubt the Council of 879-880 preserves all the external and internal elements of an ecumenical council. That is because it was convened by an emperor, just as all the ecumenical councils. A great patristic figure, St. Photius the Great, presided over it. Bishops from all the churches and even the legates of the Pope participated in it, and the issues that it faced were serious ecclesiological dogmatic, and canonical issues. That is why most interpreters and theologians describe this council as the Eighth Ecumenical, as forementioned. mentioned.